Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar titled, Improving Access to Care by Using Creative Support to Address Families Waiting for Services, sponsored by SAMHSA and developed under the TA Coalition contract and presented by the National Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health. My name is Kelly Mastin from the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors, and I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Before we introduce today's presenters, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording along with the PowerPoint presentation slides will be sent via email within three to five days to all those who registered. However, you may download the PowerPoint slides now for your convenience at the top of your screen where it says PowerPoint slides, or excuse me, PowerPoint presentation. Please click on Upload File to download the slides. For participants only, audio is being streamed to your computer speakers with no need to connect by phone unless necessary, in which case the phone number is listed in the notes section on your screen. If you are having any technical difficulties during this webinar, please type your comment in the Q&A pod on the right side of your screen and someone will be able to assist you. Please also type your questions for the presenters in the Q&A pod, and at the end of the presentation, we will ask as many questions as we can. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you take a few moments to complete a short evaluation to give us feedback. Please know that we do not offer CEU credits for our webinars, but we'll send you a letter of attendance upon request. My email address will be available at the top of the screen during the evaluation. I would like to thank SAMHSA for allowing us to share this information with you today, and again, thank you for joining us. I will now turn it over to today's moderator, Dr. Linda Gargan, Executive Director for Federation of Families, who will introduce today's presenters. Linda? Thank you, Kelly, so much. Uh, it's great to be with everyone today. Thank you so much for joining our webinar on this very important topic about wait lists and how we support our families. We have two excellent presenters today, and most of you already know them, but let me go ahead and introduce each of them. Lisa Lambert is the Executive Director of the Parent Professional Advocacy League, which we know as PPAL. It's a statewide, family-run, grassroots, nonprofit organization based in Boston. Lisa serves on the Advisory Council for the Children's Mental Health Network. Her areas of expertise include mental health policy, systems advocacy, and family-driven research. Realizing that individual parent and youth stories need to be supported by data, Lisa authored several family-driven studies which highlighted the challenges families encounter when accessing services, their perspectives on psychotropic medications, and the training needs of family partners. Lisa has been instrumental in working with local and national media to highlight the concerns of families and children. She is dedicated to ensuring that family voice is included in every state and national conversation about the policies, practices, or services that impact them. And now let me take a moment to introduce Gail Cormier. Gail has over 25 years experience providing national and statewide technical assistance with expertise in working with families, youth, and emerging adults. She is a proven national family leader and has both professional and family lived experience. She acts as project director for over seven SAMHSA grants and has led the way in developing and supporting families who need services and support for their children from birth to retirement. Gail also supports family organizations, family peer support, and policymaking boards that aid in the growth and development of child, youth, and family serving systems within peer organizations statewide in North Carolina and across the nation. Her knowledge is demonstrated through involvement on several levels. 
At the national level, she is well known as a pro for a proactive approach to solving issues in strength-based and respectful manners and is seen as an amiable partner for working with family-run organizations. Gail recently led North Carolina Families United to create a national family and youth training center of excellence to promote youth, emerging adults, and family-driven trainings and trainers from across the country. So I'm sure you will agree with me that we have two very experienced, exciting presenters here today. And with that, I will turn this over to Gail. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And good afternoon from a very dreary state of North Carolina. Um, I hope everyone is being safe. And I would like to begin the conversation by telling you why this conversation came up. I had a family that was receiving wraparound, and we got the first referral. And the referral process went pretty smoothly. They got their referral. And then they were getting ready to have their very first high-fidelity wraparound meeting. What happened was our family kind of got stuck in the waiting box. And that is when our family partners from our family organization realized it was going to be several weeks before we could get anything through, that we had to really jump to helping with the crisis review, a uh, report. We had to talk about what we could do before the full wraparound team came together. When I was discussing this topic, I also talked to my colleague, Lisa, from Massachusetts. And we were sharing some very common similarities. And we thought we might be able to come up with an idea of how we can share what we're doing to cut down on the waiting list or alleviate the waiting list, but also how different states are really managing these waiting lists and how important the family-run organizations are in helping families while they wait for the full line of services. So that's sort of what happened. And just as Lisa and I were talking about this, Linda called and said, can we do a national presentation? And I said, yeah, I have the idea, Lisa and I and you. And we had a discussion, and that's where we came from. And that's why we're here today. So if we could go to my first slide. Oh, and there's my beautiful state. We can go to the next state, the next slide. So North Carolina, North Carolina families have a wait list, and we have identified supports and services in many areas. We have a real vibrant hi-fi wraparound project that we have implemented with the state at North Carolina NCDHHS, and the state, along with the support from North Carolina Families United, has really implemented Hi-Fi Wraparound. And our Hi-Fi Wraparound came out of the seeds for the um, System of Care Grants. You know, in those statewide System of Care Grants, we really put in a real emphasis on having the team, so what perfect teams for Hi-Fi Wraparound when you have a family partner, a youth partner, and a facilitator and coach. So we implemented that during our grant time. And to be wonderful, when our system of care grant ended, the state was not, did not have to reduce staff in any area except the evaluation team. They cut one part-time person. Everybody else was able to be sustained, and they are to, to this day. And we have different hi-fi wraparound projects going, on, going in in different regions in coordination with private providers and the managed care organizations for each area. We also have clinical therapeutic support. And the clinical therapeutic support has been extremely um, valuable, not only before COVID, which I like to refer to as BC, before COVID, or now, currently, I guess that's AD. And now these clinical therapeutic supports have even become more important. Our in-home behavioral services have actually 
expanded during COVID, but even prior to that, we've had some really solid ideas and policies around how we can manage a waiting list. Currently, the in-home behavioral services have actually been bumped up because we do not at this time, or we have limited. I, I understand there are a few areas in North Carolina that have they have at the moment, but um, for the most part during COVID, we've taken that emphasis off and kind of put it in the in-home behavioral services. Respite care, well, I think like every state in the nation, that is our most limited and has the highest wait list and also is the most asked for for all our families. Our family peer support, it's a vibrant community. Back in 2006, we had, I believe, eight family partners in the state that identified as family partner peer support. And we now bump up to about 500, and North Carolina Fems United, along with the Department of Health and Human Services, have really put an emphasis and real support behind family peer support as well as youth peer support. And of course, we have psychiatric residential beds, and things are changing there currently. We had some really good wait lists and policies, but currently with the COVID, Things have radically changed, but I'm going to talk about each individual piece, and then I'm going to also discuss a little bit how things have changed during COVID and this pandemic. If we could go to the next slide. So Hi-Fi, High Fidelity Wraparound in North Carolina. The team, we have these policies, and we're really kind of proud of this, and the policies weren't made from the top down. These were policies that were developed by a, a team of individuals through UNC Greensboro, the state, state team, and the family voice, North Carolina Families United, as well as other local area family, um, families and youth that are a part of the teams have all lent voice into these policies. So the first thing we did is the team must hold first meetings within 30 days of referral. So if you get a referral and a family and a youth are in need of high fidelity wraparound, we must respond within the first 30 days. We could extend it out to 45 if we have a verbal approval and there has to be a real solid reason. However, implementation of wraparound plan must begin within 48 hours after the first meeting. This is really important. That first meeting, when you start making those plans, we cannot, and we did not feel right to say, okay, you're going to need X, Y, and Z, but they're not coming in, until six months. There's a big waiting list. So we had to make sure that on our first wraparound meeting that we were able to promise something that could be implemented within 48 hours. Now, that doesn't mean that if you have an issue that really needs to be resolved and there's, for instance, clinical support, but they have a long waiting list. We're not going to totally forget about that, but it will not be on our first wraparound meeting plan. That'll be something to discuss when it becomes more available. We don't want to set families up to wait with excitement when things cannot happen. And if you remember, families are in need of things today and if you don't strike well, the iron is hot. Families will lose focus of that, or they'll be disappointed. And we really want our families to know that we care, we support, and we wrap around them. And along with a high fidelity wrap around, every family gets the choice of a family or a youth peer support partner. You can get one, you can get one or the other, depending on the age of the, the young person. If there's a very independent 15-year-old, maybe they would prefer to go with a, fam a youth peer support person with sort of the family peer support as a backup. Or if you may have a 15-year-old that actually needs more of the family peer support, we can do it the other way. And we understand that young people, our wraparound covers ages 0 to 21, but we know that transition age youth, that 14 to 21-year-olds and beyond, some the age of 
emotional development and the need of the parent varies. So we vary the decision on who has the peer support, either the family or the youth. The next page, please. So how do we eliminate red tape? Well, while we're waiting for a full complement of services, the family and the youth support must be available on day one, and it always is. And that is a real piece of where we can really support the family and wrap around them until those further services down the road might be available. Family and youth peer support can help by creating a family-centered futures plan. If anyone understands the McGill mapping process, um, it was developed up in Toronto, I believe, or uh, actually at the University of McGill, for the IDD population. It was brought down here through the University of New Hampshire and very other entities to do youth transition projects like we knew. North Carolina Families United actually uses that McGill planning process, those maps or that futures plan is what we call it, for, for our families with our family partners. So within the first four weeks of a family partner getting a family or youth peer support partner getting a family, a youth, they must do a mapping process. And that really helps guide the plan of how that family or that youth peer support will work with the family from that moment on. And it includes all those services that may or may not have immediate entrance. Family and youth or family-run organizations can help families find natural support. So obviously, while we're waiting, and one of the real key critical issues is if you're waiting for some, important, some service that might be a clinical service or even hospitalization, a peer support individual, whether it's a family or a youth peer support person, can actually take that time and help support and bring in natural supports to build up that family while they wait for other services. Next page. Now our hospitals, this has changed slightly um, since I put this together because we did this again in BC. Um, but I'm going to read it to you and then I'll explain a little bit of the differences. Our, our criteria is very similar to SAMHSA's criteria, I think. And basically, a child must meet the general criteria of admission to the North Carolina Neuroscience Hospitals as outlined in the inpatient psychiatric policy. The patient must have primary psychiatric illness and be in need of an inpatient treatment or comprehensive diagnostic services. And remember, we always look for the less restrictive environment before we get to this level. Patients should be at least five years old and under 18 years old, and we actually have had some three and four year olds, but that's another story. Patients should be at the developmental level and be medically stable enough to have some ability to participate in the unit programming. Unit conditions must be conducive to the provision of safe, comprehensive care. Now, in the past, we have had even news stories about our ED waiting list. And the state and with the voices of family and youth and consumers have really worked very hard to reduce the ED waiting list. But honestly, it can be up to three days. And we know that. And that's a very tough time. I think. Um, my colleague Lisa may talk about one story about her and her family, but I know that here is another place where family partner support or youth peer support really comes into play. And we can tell you a story about a family that their nine-year-old child was in the ED and it was day two, and that parent did not have clean clothes and was not going home. She was staying with her daughter in the emergency department. The family partner that was assigned to her actually bought, went to Walmart, got a couple of pairs of underwear, got a couple of things. You know, we have a little bit of a flex funds, and helped the parent change her clothes and actually brought her clothes home and did her laundry for her. So there is that extra family, that real support. I've walked 
I've walked this walk and I understand what you're going to, through. And clean clothes is something that would make the parents feel comfortable. So those are kind of the stories that we have used while the emergency wait happens. Other family partners have actually brought games or youth games to the ED and to keep the parents busy. But that's also a natural time to complete a futures plan. If the parent that is waiting with their child um, has never met a futures uh, family partner, this is a time to connect and maybe do an informal futures plan so they can start working on some basic things while the hospital care is being um, coordinated. Next page. Family and youth peer support, if available in the area, can accompany a parent while in the emergency department, just like I just discussed. Crisis plan development by family-run organizations or family and youth peer support, we often become and first of all, family and youth peer support is not a clinical process. So we get the question, how can you do a crisis plan with the family if you're not clinical? All our families, um, and we say this over and over again, we do not have an official clinical crisis plan, but we can help through the futures plan figure out what helps and what hurts a family. And we also will, with family-driven voice really, really move to learn what the family's dreams are, what the family's fears are, what's really going to screw up those dreams, and how do you get through them, and what happens in the case of an emergency? What do you plan to do? Who do you call? How do we go through this? And any capable family or youth peer support person or anyone from a family-run organization can work through this and it's a very vital document. We can also put what helps, what hurts. You know, for instance, if a child is escalating and you want to demand a child to do X, Y, and Z and they're not doing it and they're saying they're hungry, well, some people identify this is what hurts. If I am not, I guess, what is that word, hangry? I am hangry and I'm not going to focus. So sometimes part of that crisis plan is make sure that I'm not hangry and I have something to eat. And you, and I, I don't know about you, but I have a child who struggles with attention deficit and to this day, she's 33, if she's hangry, there's no reasoning with her and she just escalates off, just right off. Feed her and she's the nicest person. So as parents, I'm sure we can all, uh, you know, relate to some of those things. But that is what a family partner and a peer support person can do to help develop a crisis plan. And of course, family and youth peer support can help by creating any kind of plan. Within the futures plan, you can help families see how to get their children through high school, to get themselves a job, to get better housing, whatever it is and whatever modality they need to be serviced at. Next page, please. Um, I see a question from Kiwi. Kiwi, does your family support assist only the parents? Um, no, we do a whole family, well, family partner peer support only supports the parents to parents, yes, and we have youth peer support that only supports the youth. But as part of the family team and the futures plan, that, that actually supports the whole family. But the word family peer support means, well, in, our, in North Carolina, it's the parent walking alongside another parent. So that's the primary person. And Stephanie said, oh, she just thanks us for the presentation. It came at a great time. Well, Stephanie, I hope you like the rest of our presentation. Continuing, wait times and list, clinical therapeutic supports in home behavioral services. So here in North Carolina, we have these things really vary by regions. And if you saw the map at the beginning that I kind of rushed through, we, North Carolina has 100 counties, 100. And in each county, it's 
everything is county run and every county has different rules and also the rural areas are more likely to have a longer waiting list than the more um, suburban. Um, so we do have, and the urban areas also experience wait lists, but it might be a little bit different. So we do vary from place to place. And currently in home behavioral health services, I'm proud to say during, during COVID have been so bumped up that last week, I believe we didn't have a wait list at all. And families are really working with that. Um, that is one of the things the way I'm very proud of North Carolina and the Department of Health and Human Services right now during their COVID interactions. They're, they're hosting weekly provider updates, but they're also hosting weekly um, family and youth and consumer updates every Monday. So they, uh, they have their ears to the ground and they're listening to the people calling in and they're answering their questions. And one of the things was is to bump up these two areas. And that's what we're doing. Um, here during, before COVID, we did not have a real issue with getting educational services. You know, we had the traditional um, issues. But now during COVID, I'm sure everybody on this list knows the number one call that North Carolina Films United is getting and the state is getting is how do you implement those services through the, from the IEP when you're, you're taking care of your child and you're teaching the child at home on their own. So, you know, young people's behaviors are not on hold, even if our state is on hold and our school systems are at, on hold. So that's one of our challenges currently. Um, so anyways, we can go to the next list, the next page, respite. As I said, this is the hard one, and I don't have any real answers to this. Family partners have actually worked with their families when they have a child and family team or a wraparound team, depending on what you want to call it, in your state, that they've been able to bring in natural support and kind of figure out through the child and family team who could be able to take care of that child, even if it's 45 minutes in the home one day a week to give the mother a break to maybe do an extra set of laundry or to vacuum or maybe even to read a book sometimes. So there, there are a lot of creative ways that we have used respite, even if we don't have formalized respite. Now, we do have a very limited, very, very, very limited formalized respite. But for our behavioral health needs, that's usually not an option. So. I apologize that we don't have that. But natural supports are really, really important. And we've brought in families that may actually even go to a neighbor's house one day a week, for, well, their child would, and you know, use those real different kinds of natural supports to be creative. And you know, babysitting, bringing in a, a babysitter for a while where the mom goes shopping, while the mom's in the other room reading a book, babysitting, or sleep at a grandma's house, or a friend, a good friend, or you know, whatever we, whatever it takes. Next page. And of course, we now can go virtual. Now I don't know about you, but I've become an expert. I thought I was good on this virtual information, BC, but since then. I feel like I'm an expert, and I bet everybody else is. And to um, take from my colleague Lisa Lambert's line, it's Zoom, 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 and we do have a lot of Zoom meetings. But we're finding something pretty interesting. Although some of our families don't have the capability and the capacity of Internet service or even sometimes cell phones, families are really responding to the virtual services. Um, a lot of them are feeling overwhelmed by just being, and I know you all know this too, there are so many services that came into play during COVID that they're getting slammed with emails and notifications and calls that there needs to be a place where they can sort it out. Well, we're hosting virtual meetings called Community Connections every Monday, and we have a topic 
And that topic allows families and family peer support and youth peer support to all come together and talk about those topics that are very stressful currently. And also, we're going to keep it on after the pandemic subsides a bit when we get back to in the office. But they have been talking. We've been trying to problem solve together. We keep the online activities pretty creative. We do a lot of really interesting pieces. There is something that I have uploaded to the Power presentation that I want you to know. And it says, North Carolina Collaborative May 26th. COVID guidelines for child and family teens. Now, you guys are the first to get this, mostly. A couple of weeks ago, uh, several weeks ago, I got lots of calls from North Carolina and from the families we served saying, okay, now that we're all quarantined, our child and family team and our wraparound meetings aren't being held. Um, there, are, there were different reasons. You know, Some said the providers didn't feel comfortable in having child and family team meetings through Zoom because they didn't feel it was um, confidential enough because they were doing it with a team and they didn't know who everybody else, you know, in my house here, I have my husband down, and he can't hear me right now, but he's here. You know, there's different interferences, there's different people listening than a traditional office setting or wherever you have your child and family teams in the past, and there are outside influences. So there were a lot of child and family teams not being held because of that. There were also child and family teams that weren't being held because the family didn't have access to internet or the family didn't have cell phones. So we came together. I brought this up to the North Carolina Collaborative. And the Collaborative was um, developed early in the late 90s. Uh, yeah, I'd say about 95, 96. It was out of the Simpsons the SAMHSA grants for system of care, and our North Carolina State Collaborative is very, very bright, vibrant. North Carolina Families United has been there from day one, and we play a very big role to this day. And there are many family and youth and cross-agency and family and youth organizations in all cross systems that attend this twice a month event. Well, I brought to the table, we really needed to give some guidelines Families aren't getting the child and family team or the wraparound meetings like they requested. And providers, frankly, didn't need it some creative ways. So we had a mass call and a big meeting, and it was very filled with family and youth voice and provider voice, which is equally as important. And we came together to say, what's going on? And we came up with some real creative ways. For instance, we have some providers who who actually have those throwaway cell phones, they're not called throwaway, but they're temporary phone calls, they will bring them to a family's area, home, if the family doesn't have cell phone usage, and put it in their mailbox with instructions on how to use it, and then have host a phone call for therapy or child and family teams. Other areas are using the Zoom, and we found out that some people don't feel the state Folks really don't feel comfortable with Zoom, so we use WebEx, which is a little bit more secure, to have the child and family team. Anyways, long story short, that is a two-page guideline for having child and family team meetings or wraparound meetings that I welcome you to upload, distribute, take our name, and give us a little credit. But you may make it used for your particular state if you want. That's my gift to you. Next page. And I get to turn it over to Lisa. Well, thank you, Gail. And um, welcome, everybody, once again. Um, after a cold and dreary spring here in Massachusetts, we are looking for a warmer summer. We have a nice day today. So it's cheering us up because it's been a tough spring. Um, Gail and I have talked about this, as she mentioned earlier, and great minds think alike, and some of what we're doing for strategies are similar, and other things, of course, are very unique to each one of our states. So I wanted to start today with talking about what it is like when families wait. Families expect the system to look like the, the graph with the yellow background. They think you go in at a lower level of care, like outpatient. You talk to your pediatrician. Pediatrician says, why don't you you know, contact a therapist. Um, and um, they think that, you know, if that doesn't work, that maybe you'll have systems, 
you know, uh, help like in-home therapy or in-home um, kinds of supports. If that doesn't work, maybe you're going to apply to a state agency for some of the services that they uniquely provide and so on onto acute care. But that's not the way it works in reality. The way it works in reality is you call the therapist and you, you wait for the most part um, because they don't have an opening or they don't take your insurance or they don't see children. One mother told me when we did a short survey that her private insurance gave her a list of 15 providers to call and three of the people on the list were dead. And so that wasn't going to work, and it was very um, upsetting to her, of course, which is why she shared it. Um, sometimes people wait for the community-based services, and those two can have a wait. Um, if you're trying to apply for state agency services, you go through uh, forms and uh, a review process. Um, and uh, other higher acute levels of care also have barriers, such as you know who funds what and um, what the weights might be, and I'll talk about hospitalization a little bit later. So what does this mean for families? It means they're pretty discouraged because they thought they were going to, like, finally agree to make that phone call to a family, or they were going to finally take that very brave step of saying, things are not okay in my house. And what do they get? They get, well, we can't help you right now. That's what they get a lot of the time. And um, sometimes they get the wrong service because the service that they need is uh, full or has a weight. So someone says, why don't you try this? So maybe they need an intensive in-home service and they get outpatient or they get something where the weight is shorter. And we get a lot of calls like that at our organization. Someone calls up and you know we do an intake uh, kind of a phone call with them and we say, well, what, what kinds of services have you had? And they say, we've had this and this and this and this. And my child's no better because they didn't get the right service a lot of times because they were sort of um, shepherded along to the place with the smallest weight. And sometimes the child worsens while, while, the, while the parent is waiting, and they may end up going to a higher level of service, a more acute level of service, than they thought that they would. So obviously the graph on the blue, with the blue background, shows what it, how it actually works. And it's not always that, that way. Sometimes you do get into one or the other of the services, but many times it is a lot more fragmented and it's not this smooth flow um, that um, people are expecting. And um, the people who are supposed to guide you from one set of services to the next, a lot of times do not. So that there is this break again where families go, not in a smooth sort of um, pattern or, or, or progression, but they go into a, uh, you know, uh, a side stream or a side, you know, alley somewhere. So, so next slide. So what kinds of help do families need? Um, they need quick, cut-to-the-chase information. They need someone to say, aha, I know what you need. I know what you should do. Don't go in that door. Go in this door. I can help you figure out from you telling your story to me that um, where you need to start is here. Don't waste your time doing step one, two, and three. You know, let's go right in at step four. So they need someone who can customize the steps for them. And that's what we do as a family-run organization. Um, that's what family partners often do in our state, so you need a referral to get to most of them. Um, but, you know, the entry-level phone call or access point should really be helping families to do all of those things. They need somebody who can network for them and with them because they often don't know what's in their neighborhood. They have no idea how to get to this service or uh, how to find a resource that will help them while they're waiting. And so that kind of help is really um, important and it really makes the process um, a lot better, a lot less um, concerning, a lot less scary because people will be able to connect to a resource center or they'll be able to connect to a support group, or they'll be able to connect to something that can help them while they're trying to get to where they ultimately want to go. They need someone to explain um, that there's a difference between what can happen and what should happen. Parents will often hear things like, oh, you should do this. You should call here. You should have this. And when they do, they're frequently told, well, we can, we can help you, but, you know, you're going to have to wait a little while. Or, um, you know, we're not the service for you. Or in the case of um, rapid staff turnover, people might say that they simply don't have the slot available right now. Um, they need someone to coach them along the way, stay in touch, 
um, and they need someone to advocate, which we do a lot of, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as um, we, we go on in this. So, next slide. So, as a family-run organization, I know somebody had a question about family-run organizations. Um, this is, these are some of the things that we do. The list of what we do is really, really long, um, but this is some of what we do. So obviously, when someone calls, there needs to be sort of a reflection back to them. This is what I hear you say is going on. This is what I would do first. Um, you're doing a good job. The system's complicated. All of that kind of, um, of back and forth, that kind of conversation, that kind of um, helping people get their feet underneath them again or figure out what their first option should be or figure out um, that they're really pretty um, competent, but they just don't have the knowledge that they need. And so we're here to help them. We're here to fill in those blanks. Sometimes they need individual advocacy. And when I say that, in my state anyway, in a lot of places, people think that that means they need individual advocacy with school. Well, it can be advocacy with your insurance company. It can be advocacy with um, somebody in your community or you're looking to get a service. Maybe it's a clinic and someone, you know, they. The family has not told them enough information for them to be triaged to a better place in the list. So that kind of advocacy sometimes needs to take place. But family-run organizations also identify themes and we identify patterns that we hear. So if we're starting to hear about a real difficulty with um, an access point, then we're going to be able to identify that for our state partners and our system partners by hearing hundreds of stories from families instead of one or two, like, um, or, or looking at claims data where you can't really necessarily identify the trends in the same way. Um, we do the systems advocacy, which I just touched on. And then when Linda spoke in the introduction about some of what we do, we collect a lot of data. We, we collect data from our call logs. We collect data from a variety of um, avenues, including little polls and, and all of that. But we also do a lot of research. We're just finishing a survey closed this morning on telehealth and what families think about that. I've got to tell you, I've probably had eight um, emails from various people, including systems folk and um, providers who are saying, we really want to see the results of your study. And we had 202 parents respond, and we're going to be happy to share that data. But that data will tell people a lot more than someone explaining where they hit a bump in the road in being able to access telehealth or access someone else. So we try to do both things. We try to collect the question, I mean, the, the stories, and we try to collect the data because the two of them go hand in hand to really defining what it is that um, is causing some of these problems, including rates. And we're fortunate enough, Gail mentioned that they're on a Monday call. We're fortunate enough to be in a number of venues as well to be able to bump issues up to other people because sometimes we only have part of the puzzle. Sometimes, you know, someone else will chime in and say, well, from my perspective, this is what we're seeing, and it'll form a better picture. And with a better picture, we can solve the problem a lot more easily. So next slide. So these are some of the things that we have learned really increase wait times. And um, again, with the caveat that we wrote all of these things out when, before COVID, and some of these things may change after COVID. So workforce issues comes up again and again in our state, and I'm sure it comes up in a lot of states as being a, a um, persistent issue. Um, many times the people who fill the positions such as the in-home work are people at the beginning of their career arc, and they're people who really um, are still learning, and sometimes that's frustrating because we have the most um, inexperienced people working with the most complicated families. But the other part of that is that these are people who, because it's a first job, they leave and there's some turnover and then there's a new person and frequently there's a gap in between. So we'll just pick on in-home therapy as a service. So if there's a certain demand for in-home therapy and a parent and their family find an in-home therapist they like, that person may only last a certain amount of time. And then they're moving on to a different job which is good for them in their career path, but it leaves the family high and dry until the agency can hire a new person. So those workforce issues continue to be 
um, a really difficult thing that increases wait times because the family, as I mentioned before, is getting discouraged, they're looking for a service, they may end up in another service, and it contributes to all of those factors. There's a lot of confusion about who funds what. Um, we used to get that question more directly, but the more funders we have, and we do have a lot of funders in our state, the more confusing it is for families. So um, if they want to have um, something that's a straightforward insurance service, then or insurance funded service, then, then that's easier to explain. But sometimes the state agency funds community-based services, and it, they're a little different than the ones that Medicaid funds or private insurance funds. And families will say, well, what about that? And we'll say, well, you have to be, you know, a, a client of, you have to be, have a service authorization from this particular state agency to get that. Or the family will be um, uh, told that a certain agency is the payer of last resort, which is something I'm sure all of you have heard. And so while they're thinking that, gee, I have this team of people who are funding certain things, maybe they'll fund this too, the team says, or someone on the team says, well, no, that agency over there or that funder over there pays for it, and if they can't, we'll step up. So those delays in deciding who is going to fund something contributes to wait for families. And families don't always know that. We know that as an organization, and if they tell us the story, we can hear what's going on behind the scenes. But again, it's something that will contribute to wait. Um, some children are more likely to wait for services than others. And if the child's diagnose, diagnosis or their set of behaviors is complicated and acute, they're more likely to wait. The um, grouping that we hear uh, most often presents the most difficulties for accessing services is a um, combination of a child who's on the spectrum and who has an autism diagnosis and then a psychiatric disorder, such as bipolar um, or a mood disorder. Um, because the treatments, um, they're sort of two separate treatments, and there aren't a lot of skilled providers who can blend those treatments in order to be effective for the child. Or the child will need um, a greater intensity. They will not just need a one-on-one -on -one therapy, but maybe something more than that, something to augment that. And so because the complexity of the response um, it's not always available, that also can contribute to wait, and that's very frustrating for families as well. How the parent is perceived also increases wait times. And those of you who are, are parents who are listening in are nodding your heads right about now because you know what that's like. Um, if the parent is engaging and the parent seems like they're not confrontive, the child may get help quicker. Um, but that doesn't mean that the parent's advocacy isn't needed. It is needed. Um, we've all learned, who are veteran parents over the years, um, to sort of combine the elements that we need to um, with being firm and with being very direct about what it is our child needs, while at the same time um, not leading with our most, um, let's say, forceful message. Um, but that's something that's learned over time. And when your child's in crisis, you're scared and you're really um, frustrated and you're trying to um, Express what it is that you think we, you know, we the family needs in a way that nobody will be able to ignore. And um, so that's a matter of strategy, but how the parent is perceived is sometimes a factor in, in wait times, unfortunately. I mentioned earlier provider listings with the parent who got a listing and there were dead providers um, on her uh, list. And I will tell you at the time, my uh, the Massachusetts State Legislature was uh, hearing a bill that would require private insurers to update their provider directories more often. And um, I went and testified, and I put up a quick poll, um, and about 100 and something parents replied in, in a few days, and this parent was one of them. And I said to the legislature, if everyone nationally is worried about dead people voting, aren't you worried about dead people treating children in therapy? Maybe it wasn't the most politically correct, but they laughed. They're often bored listening to all of us, and when you can get them to laugh and engage with you, they pay much more attention. And after I said that, they paid attention to everything that, um, that I did say, and I will talk a little bit more about where that is all going, and that is going pretty well right now. So we have a seasonality issue as well, and I'm sure many of you do in your states. Um, traditionally, 
the highest rate of demand for acute care services uh, for children is in the late fall, somewhere around Thanksgiving, maybe October, Halloween, Thanksgiving, tapers off by the Christmas holiday, and it, the next the next seasonal you know uptick tends to be February, March, April. This year, because of the corona virus um, that has really been impacted, and parents have really been trying to keep their kids out of hospitals for obvious reasons. Um, so we don't know what's going to happen um, after um, it is deemed to be safer because those kids didn't get any better waiting at home, most of them at any rate. Um, sometimes we see children who are in the care and custody of child welfare um, sitting stuck in certain places. They could be in a residential program, a group home, uh, acute care, and for the uh, social worker who's working in child welfare, that child's safe. That child has three meals and a roof over their head. For the system, that child is sitting there, and you wish that there would be more flow. You wish that child would move on when they no longer need to be in that setting so that that space can be available for another child. And we do see that periodically, depending on what's going on with the politics of uh, in child welfare. And then the last but certainly not least is sometimes nobody's advocating for the family and nobody's advocating for the child or networking and trying to get um, uh, the child um, moved into a, a, better, a better situation. So next slide. Okay, so about uh, two years ago, we did a survey um, of families who were sitting in a hospital emergency departments or had in the previous 12 months, I think is what the time period used. And we asked them about their experience as they sat in hospital emergency departments. That was the thing that we were the most interested in. So my organization, PAL, is part of a children's mental health campaign. And we have five lead organizations and one of the other, and we're one, and one of the other organizations is Children's Hospital Boston. So what we did is companion surveys. Children's Hospital Boston asked um, emergency departments in nine hospitals across the state to take one week a month and um, record data about the kids who came in and stayed there for longer than 12 hours. So those children, um, they asked them how old those children were, they asked them what kind of insurance those children had. They asked them, you know, obviously the gender of the child, um, you know, what the presenting situation was, diagnosis, a whole bunch of things like that. And they compiled their data. And we did a very similar thing on our side. What was really interesting is that the data jived. The two, our two sets of data were almost completely identical in an awful lot of the categories. So I'm just going to show you a couple of slides from what happened because it talks a lot. It tells a lot about how, as an organization, you can really impact wait times um, by being creative, by, by through advocacy, and by also forming a coalition with other groups, which is what we did. So we had 411 families respond to our survey. And um, we have a lot of kids sort of on both sides of 12 under 12 and over 12 who um, we, parents whose parents have reported that they're sitting in emergency departments. So the mean age of the children was 14 years. Most of them had a sibling waiting at home, which is really, really important because the parents were waiting, as you can see, and I'll talk about that in a minute, for quite a long period of time. And they couldn't leave the child because they're not allowed to in the emergency department, but they had other children at home who needed them too. And it was a very, um, what do I want to say, untenable situation for most of the parents. So it's a little breakdown here, which um, I'll talk about in a minute, of, um, of the race ethnicity of, of the families. And we almost always ask that, I will say, in every survey. Um, there's certain questions we ask in every single survey, demographic questions, and we're able to compare that over time. And we've been doing surveys of families since the year 2000, so 20 years now. So this is what the weights look like. Most of the families, um, many of the families, uh, waited uh, a lot more uh, than, than the 12 hours. Probably about a quarter or a little less than a quarter waited um, for the, the 12 hours. 
and then um, a few more families waited up to 24 hours, which is, you know, a full day of waiting. Then you can see one in five families waited between, that's the yellow wedge, one in five families waited between one and four days in the emergency department. So here they are with the child who's sometimes out of control. Um, they might have packed a little bag. Um, they don't know what's going to happen next. And it's very frustrating. So we wanted to capture what happened. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the whole survey, but we wanted to capture what had happened um, with those families. Um, you'll see the 8% of the families waited more than one week. And um, most of the families who waited those really lengthy periods of time had children who had that combination of um, autism and a mood disorder or psychiatric disorder and being on the spectrum. And that's what the parallel um, survey by Children's Hospital found as well. So next slide. So we asked them, well, were you made comfortable? You know, here you are sitting there 12 hours, 24 hours, whatever amount of time it is, one would think that you'd look over at this poor parent sitting there and or standing there or whatever they're doing and say, how can I help you? And um, parent, if the parent had a young child, a 10-year-old, an 11-year-old, they were much more likely to be offered a glass of water or a chair or have someone say, can we wheel a television in for you? Um, and uh, uh, then if they had an older child. Um, and we asked parents um, whether or not they were kept in the loop. So when the emergency department called the insurance company, were they told your insurance company approved this? When they called a, a possibly admitting hospital, uh, were you told that? And as you can see, sometimes they were and sometimes they won't. Now, if you look at the blue graph that's on the left-hand side, the smallest um, bar are families who waited at home. So in our state, if a child needs to be uh, hospitalized, they meet the criteria of a danger to themselves or others, but the parent thinks and the um, mobile crisis team believes that that child can safely wait at home with visits and support from the mobile crisis team, then they may agree to do that, to have the child wait at home. We found out also that many of those children didn't have safety plans, and I know Gail mentioned safety plans as well which was really, really concerning. Um, so less than half of the families were made comfortable. Um, probably a third were given a food, food, or, food or a beverage or something along those lines. And many of them reported that they were uncomfortable. The next slide. <clears throat> so the other thing that we did is we took the number of families. Remember I talked about the race ethnicity? And we put them into two buckets. We didn't have enough families who were, for instance, Asian to, to sort of take the numbers and look at African-American families who identified as African-American, Asian, Latino, or whatever. So we did two buckets. We did white families and non-white families. And we asked, um, you know, we looked at the answers to our questions about whether they were offered amenities. White parents were almost three times more likely to be offered amenities. Um, they were more likely to have a staff member give them a break and sit there uh, or let them go home and see their other children. Um, they uh, were more likely to be told, almost twice as likely to be told what the insurance company said. So it is really um, glaring that, you know, there's this um, real divide between how families are treated based on their race ethnicity. So I will tell you we had a forum um, the Children's Mental Health Campaign had a forum, and Children's Hospital presented their data. We presented ours. And when our state looked at this and saw this, everyone was aghast because it was one of those really invisible problems. Sure, families said, I had a bad experience here. I feel I was discriminated against. But this is data. This is 411 families saying this is what we experienced. And that has a lot more power and it has a lot more ability to um, be able to push hard uh, a system that really needs to change in some respects. And that was a really important thing to do. The other thing I will say is that um, families at this point had, had been kind of fed up. And um, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but I'll say right now that um, we have seen a huge increase in families using social media 
to talk about in real time what's happening to them and to seek guidance and help from other families and also from organizations like ours while they're going through some of these experiences. So while families were sitting there in emergency departments, not being offered something to drink, um, one mom set up a wonderful closed Facebook page for parents of children who have mental health issues. And um, parents were going on there. They're on their cell phone, and their child's in the emergency department. And they're saying, I'm sitting in the emergency department at ABC Hospital, and I'm being offered a bed at DEF Hospital. And other parents would say, great choice, or they would say, I'm not so sure. And so there was a lot of real time back and forth going on as parents asked, asked advice. But they were also talking about their experience. I'm not getting, you know, any help. And people would advise them, you know, have this happen or have that happen, ask for this, use these words. But another mom, and she was a mom who has a daughter with that diagnosis we talked about, she decided that she was going to set up a meal train. So on this Facebook page, she set up a meal train, and people donate to the meal train, other parents, five bucks, ten bucks, whatever, and she has a fund. And so for the parents who are sitting in the waiting room, meals can be delivered. A pizza can be sent to that mother. Or if the family decides that it's what they prefer, the mother will fend for herself, and the pizza will be sent home to the other siblings who are waiting at home. And these are creative ways to help families. And that, that's a very grassroots level. I have to say, and I'm sure Gail will agree, that one of the jobs of a family-run organization is to create parent leaders who will see something going on, and they will say to themselves, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let that be like that. I'm going to take a small step or a large step to be able to fix that. So next, next slide. So the other thing that happened, it was sort of underway. Remember I said, talked about collaborations, is the Department of Mental Health who licenses the, um, not the emergency departments, but they license the inpatient psychiatric units. They stepped in, and there was a lot going on on the provider side and other sides too, but the experience of families was part of the conversation about them creating a new expedited admission policy. And they took the data partly from these two studies, which matched up, um, and they said, okay, we're going to call it a boarding child or a waiting child if the child waited, and I think it's 12 hours, I'm, I did not go back and check. And so they have a policy which has been sent out to every emergency department and mobile crisis team. And the policy basically says that if a child is waiting for X amount of time, then um, the insurance company has to be contacted directly. And if, it is, um, if the child is waiting for longer than that time, the Department of Mental Health gets in and comes in. And, and they do a lot of different things. They call the um, uh, insurance company and they say to them, you have a child who's waiting and they can be admitted if there's a one-to-one. -one. Uh, can you fund a one-to-one? -one? Or they might call a hospital unit that refused a child because they have one of these difficult diagnoses or something else and they might say, is your no a soft no or a hard no? What can we do to help you come to a yes? And so that, that um, specific intervention has really done a lot to be able to um, help children get triaged and in um, the, right, the right spots that they need. Because parents were also having the experience of seeing a child come in after their child who got admitted quicker. And it was because um, they, they were deemed by the hospital unit to be a little bit, a little bit easier. I'll tell you, I um, heard from one family who was sitting in an emergency department with, I believe it was a 10-year-old. And um, they had uh, Procrustal Shield of Massachusetts as their insurance. And this was a number of years ago. And um, they called. And they said, we've been waiting here. And we can't get any answers. And we're frustrated and all the things that parents go through. So I happened to know the medical director of uh, the insurance agency. So I called him. Um, and his um, administrative person said, do you want me to get him? He's in the meeting. I said, oh, yeah, I want you to get him. And he's, he's a wonderful person. And he took the call. And he said, 
and, and, and they made a few calls. And when the funder calls, when the insurance company calls, it also has a sort of, um, you know, accelerating effect on things. And he said afterwards, we didn't even know that that child was sitting there because we had no mechanism to tell us that that child was sitting there. They changed their policy because of that, and I'm sure other things as well, but they changed their policy so that if the um, emergency department deemed that that child was in danger to himself or others, that they would be admitted and they wouldn't be waiting around, especially on a weekend, for the insurance company to be contacted. And when the child then is admitted, then the insurance company jumps in and talks about what's medically necessary. So that made a huge difference about emergency department waits. So we also will hear occasionally from families where the situation um, really needs individual troubleshooting. Um, I was talking to, we were talking to a parent recently um, who is sitting at a, uh, again, talking about hospitals right now, but we've done it with other services as well. So we were, she was sitting at a hospital with a 10-year-old and um, their Medicaid uh, was saying that the child did not have insurance. So their reapplication had come and gone the previous month. And um, I don't know about you, but if you call the 1-800 number in our state, a lot of times they are not that helpful. They're more for answering rogue questions, but not really specific, complicated questions. So we were able, as an organization, to call up the ladder and find out that the parent had not done something, and it was something small, like, upload a utility bill to show this was her new address or something along those lines. It was really something small. But once we got the right person, um, they were able to fix that very, very quickly. So that kind of troubleshooting and advocacy can make a huge, huge difference. The other thing that came out of all of this work is that about um, oh, nine months later, we held a forum. We held an all-day forum. And we invited several people from each emergency department to come in. And um, we had sort of an opening presentation. And then we had um, two workshops, uh, three workshops in the morning um, and three workshops in the afternoon. And you were allowed to go to two of the three workshops. So it was sort of like a round robin. You, you had enough time to go to two. Each workshop was hosted by both a parent talking about their experiences with whatever topic it was and a um, professional person who was talking from their perspective. One of those topics was when the child has autism, and we had a parent whose child has autism and a mood disorder, and she talked about what helped her during long waits. Um, another one was uh, about culture and how it can influence the experience in the emergency department. So some of the direct experiences of families, which families told to us, and we were the intermediary being able to tell other people was able to make some changes, but not just legal changes, they were practice changes for how people did business. So next slide. So as I said, we uh, collect the same data um, over and over again in surveys, and we can look at it over time. And um, I love this graph because one of the things we've been asking families, as you'll see since our very early on, is we ask families, how, um, who, who do you trust to get information? And if you look at this, you can see, and I think it is the um, blue line, that just like the rest of America, families trusted the Internet a lot at the, at the onset. They said, wow, I can get all the best information about what to do with my, for my kids and how to advocate for them. Um, and then, as we all found out that the Internet was not that trustworthy, that declined over time. The other thing that's really interesting about this is that um, uh, providers, which is the sort of dark orange line, uh, began fairly high. I think it's the yellow line. began fairly high, and it started to decline. And you can say that's a lot of different things. Maybe provider um, appointments became shorter, and there was less time for them to offer advice uh, to families. But what started to really increase is other families. And we see this the way that families talk to each other on social media for really practical advice. Many years ago, um, I ran support groups, and I will never forget, there was one mom who used to come to my support group, and she was a speech and language therapist. And she loved words, and she was very precise about words, more so than the average person, right? 
Um, so she had a daughter who was the perfect child until she became a teenager, and then she became very difficult. And she was running, and she was uh, very depressed, and um, she was skipping classes, and there were a lot of things going on. So the mother went in to talk to her daughter's therapist, and she said, I really need some help. I don't know what to do. And the therapist gave her kind of a lecture. Uh, this is what depression looks like in teenagers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And she looked the therapist right in the eye, and she said, that was very helpful, doctor, but it wasn't at all useful. And what parents are looking for is useful information to be able to navigate a lot of these um, situations, including weight. So um, uh, families communicate in a lot of different ways. And all of us need to change the way that we communicate to match their preferred ways to communicate. Um, in the past, we used to do a lot of newsletters. We still do a newsletter. But we take pieces of the newsletter and we post it on social media. And that gets a lot, read a lot more. You know, you can look at all your, um, all your metrics. And that gets read a lot more. And people respond to it a lot more. Um, sometimes we put it in other social media as well. Um, Family started contacting us, as I mentioned, through a variety of ways. Over this last weekend, I had one pa parent messenger me and another parent contact me through Facebook, both of whom had difficult situations with their children. It was a long weekend, and they really needed some help. Um, we see that a lot. Um, so parents uh, use whatever works for them, and we try really, really hard to match uh, in our ability to contact them. Uh, whatever, whatever it, it is. Being careful about privacy, of course, but a lot of times people are talking about systems. They're not really talking about what's going on with their child. They're talking about, um, you know, I'm waiting here, or I can't get someone to call me back, or some, something along those lines. Um, and we, we set the guidelines around how much they're going to talk about the details of their child's diagnosis or behaviors or symptoms or whatever. Um, because they're often not sure, you know, how much to say and how much not to say. Um, so uh, sometimes we'll all meet in, in the morning uh, on a, a group call, um, people in my organization, and, you know, compare how many people we've heard from over the weekend because they can get in touch with us and we, we can talk about that. Um, talk to them about whatever there is going on with them. So as I mentioned earlier, they started talking to us about wait times. The parent whose um, insurer I contacted was in a waiting room. Um, and we also find parents respond to our quick surveys and other ways of collecting data. Because if you can find it on your cell phone, you're going you're gonna to talk back to us in, in that way. Um, if we can collect that data and pass on the information, then we can start to make some systems change changes as well. Next slide. So I mentioned earlier, while they're waiting, parents are posing questions. Is there a longer wait here? They'll even say, which emergency room should I go to? Because wait, I want to know what the, what the um, waits are like. But they'll also ask, who gets the highest ratings? I have uh, said a long time in my state that I wish there was a trip advisor for children's mental health so people could you know, talk about how satisfied they are with this service or that service or um, you know, how something was delivered or how effective. Uh, effective it was. And families do that. They're very honest. And they're not doing it to trash people or to, you know, complain about people. Sometimes that happens. But in general, what they want to do is provide useful information for other families because they themselves know that that's what's needed. Not helpful, but useful information. Um, sometimes families will talk about how they're treated. And it's not just as I said, emergency room, we have the data on that, but maybe they call the provider and they didn't get a call back for three days and they'll say, I never got a call back. Or they'll send an email and they never heard and they'll say, this is what happened to me. It's a very different society than it was even five years ago and it's spilling into the children's mental health arena. Um, Sometimes families are given incomplete or incorrect information, and we often will have more information. And so since we're on a lot of those forums, we'll try to correct those. If there's, uh, they're saying there's no way here, and we're able to find out from the state that there is, or, um, or there's you know, openings uh, for med management here, we'll be able to pipe in and be part of that whole conversation. Sometimes in those instances, we use verbal releases. More, most of the time, we have uh, a family sign a um, written release to us, 
But if it's an urgent situation, we'll often do a verbal release. I had a telehealth visit at the beginning of uh, the stay-at-home orders in my state, and my primary care doctor used a verbal release. And um, so that's something that we're starting to see a little bit more of in a lot of different places, not just with family-run organizations. And by getting this information, we're able to talk to our state partners, of course not with specifics, not talking about what's happening to individual families, but talk a lot more about um, what's going on in, in real time. Next slide. So we don't just listen to families, we also ask questions. Because sometimes we'll have heard from one family over here about something and we want to find out from family number two where you're having the same experience. And we all learn from each other. By using these kinds of forums and these kinds of techniques, our body of knowledge together, families and family-run organizations, is increasing all the time. And of course it changes day to day, but it's increasing all the time. And it's amazing. And if somebody finds a technique that they use to shorten away time or get the attention of someone, then they share it. And we capture it, we hold on to it. Sometimes their parent A is sharing it because parent B is in a similar situation. And we're grabbing that information ourselves for a tip sheet like Gail pulled together or for some other purpose. And um, that's wonderful because you always want to find out um, techniques or strategies that somebody used and gave a thumbs up to. Um, we use quick polls a lot. We do them on Facebook. We do them various places. And I will say here, one of the things I've always found interesting is when we first started grabbing data from families, um, I really thought that our state and uh, our Medicaid agency and a variety of people would say, well, you guys on a research shop. How do you know this stuff? So we have worked with some great research partners in the past. Um, but I thought our data would be challenged. It's never been challenged. Um, you know, of course, we're really honest. We're happy to show our, our, our research tools and all of that to folks. But often, the state runs with our data and uses it for um, to, to shape. It, it fills a gap that they don't necessarily um, have filled until they can hear directly from 100 families, 200 families and what they, they thought about this. Um, we use social media, as I mentioned, um, to get families to do quick surveys. Um, the survey I mentioned on telehealth was what I call a pop-up survey. Uh, it's like a pop-up Halloween store. You know, they you know, are there for a few weeks. They sell a really limited amount of uh, items that are related to Halloween, and then they go away. Or our pop-up surveys go up for two to three weeks. There's a limited number of questions on one topic, and then it goes away. So that's what I, I call them, and that seems to, it seems to work. People seem to understand what that is. Um, we also um, use social media to ask families for specific um, data and specific information. Um, when, when we're going to, as I mentioned, to testify, or uh, we're going to do something else, then we use that um, data from families. And I will say, if you remember, I talked about that hearing where we talked about provider directories. So. Um, that legislation was rolled into a larger bill, which is the way of legislation a lot all over the country. And um, providers are, uh, insurance companies are working with providers and another part of the children's mental health campaign to make sure that those directories work for families so that they aren't a directory that serves the needs of the insurance company, but they're also very user friendly. So every little sort of piece, sometimes it doesn't yield a direct result right then, but um, hopefully it will yield a result down the line. And if families can pick up a provider directory or go online and look at one and find openings and find providers that match the needs of their children quickly, that is going to be amazing and that's going to really help shorten wait times as well. So sometimes the strategies are long term, sometimes they're in the present. And we always ask families suggestions for improvement. And the last slide. So we started out by saying that we created this, thinking, gee, you know, we can talk about weights. And then, uh, you know, COVID-19 um, impacted our entire country. I happen to be in a state that unfortunately has made the top 10 and even the top five. And so it has really had a huge impact here. I know it varies state to state, but it's had a huge impact here. Um, I can tell you that there's a less of a demand for all children's mental health services across our state. Um, Medicaid in our state has collected claims data 
and uh, they report that the utilization for many services is way down. I am in a work group with pediatricians right now, um, and also with somebody from Family Voices, where the where the Family Voice is there, um, and um, it, it's uh, around um, the the work group is around um, uh, 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 tweaking our ACO structure to be more child friendly, um, but pediatricians reported a real plummeting of, uh, of families wanting to access um, their services as well. And that showed up in the claims data um, as well. So we know families are worried about going into medical buildings. They're worried about taking their children in. They're worried about um, viruses that they might then bring back to an older relative. Um, you know, there, there's just a lot of worry. So to reduce that worry, people have just not gone to appointments. Um, when parent, um, many pediatricians, and I think uh, other providers too, at the beginning of COVID, they either sent out an email or put a, a voice message or something on, and they said, um, you know, please call us if there's an emergency or in case of an emergency. Well, our families live in a state of an emergency a lot. They have children who have meltdowns. They, they don't really know this unpredictable nature to parenting their children. And so they didn't hear emergency. They heard dire emergency. And many of them are saying, well, I'm not going to call unless, you know, I absolutely have no other choice. And so there was a real mismatch between what was intended and what our families heard. But you can see it in their behaviors. They're just not, you know, doing that. Um, we have telehealth, as I've mentioned several times, um, uh, across our state. Um, every insurance company is um, funding it. Um, but there's a lot of barriers for a lot of families. Um, there's the usual things about um, uh, you know, not enough tablets or because tablets are being used for remote learning with schools or, or other you know, not enough internet or other kinds of technological barriers. Um, uh, one mom told us it took two people to help her figure out an app so that she could use it. So there's a lot of barriers that people kind of went quickly over, but for families it's taking some time to figure out what to do about um, some of the barriers that they're, they're um, encountering in order to be able to get into that telehealth visit. Um, there's not privacy at home. There's a lot of different things that families have identified. So saying we have telehealth, leaves a lot of the conversation unsaid. It really, really does. Um, parents, however, are right on social media talking about what's going on in, in their families during COVID. Um, and um, they're very uh, um, smart and observant about what's working and what, about what's not working. We don't know what's going to happen at the end of um, the stay-at-home orders or as they start to get um, lifted. We do know parents are running hospitals in their own houses in a lot of cases. They have children who are, you know, their anxiety is ratcheted up. Their um, behaviors have been, um, you know, intensified, and parents are holding on as hard as they can. So uh, when we all can, you know, resume um, a different routine, does that mean their children's behaviors are going to abate? We don't know. Does that mean people are going to be rushing all at once? to get some help outside of their, what they have right now. We don't know that either. Um, but, um, you know, we will know immediately in real time because parents are on social media. So I'm going to ask Gail if she wants to jump in on the COVID thing right now. Um, pretty much we're doing exactly what you're, you just stated. Um, what we have found work, and I think I brought this up before, is that we are doing, not only is the state putting in weekly updates that are open to all consumers and stakeholders, but we as a family-run organization are having the community connections every Monday um, so we can answer and pretty much handhold and help families that may not even have a family or youth peer support person, but they've come to the family organization for access of services or help to be navigated, which is another job that we do. And we'll kind of talk them through what they need. And obviously, if we feel they need a family or youth peer support, we will connect them with one of our family and youth peer support as well. Um, so that seems to be a pretty good place. I know a lot of those services, and I know someone here had asked, I think it was Sherry, 
said, what are you doing when all the agencies are still closed, like in Maryland? And yeah, that's true here in North Carolina. We've, done a, we've gone all virtual. Most of every service and every provider is doing something virtual. And as of this week, our state entered phase two, uh, not a full phase two, as our governor said, a limited phase two, because the numbers aren't as exactly where he was hoping for. But with that, North Carolina Families United and some of the other providers are going to be opening up some of their face-to-face -face peer support, but it will have to be outside family. Um, my organization will not be able to transport anyone. And we will have disposable masks for the family or the youth if they want, and our staff will be wearing, this, will be wearing their assigned masks and it'll be, they'll meet their families or their youth outside, like at a picnic table or something. So those are some of the things we're doing. So oh, passing it back to Linda. Oh, yes, sorry about that. Thank you guys so much. Um, this has been wonderful. Um, uh, uh, just a couple of things. We are almost out of time, and I know uh, Kelly needs to uh, ask all of you to help with something before we get off. Uh, I think we have answered the questions as they come through, which is great. One of the things that we did was we posted a link to the National Federation website. Again, what we have here today is two incredible examples of family-run organizations, one in Massachusetts, one in North Carolina. However, we want you to know that there are family-run organizations across the country. This is a network. So if you do not know how, if you are not currently in touch with your organization, if you need more information, if you will go to the link, you will be able to find the organizations in your state. Um, Gail and Lisa, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn this back over to Kelly for some uh, last minute uh, instructions. And it was our pleasure. Exactly the same. Thank you, Linda, and thank you, Gail and Lisa, for presenting today. It was a wonderful presentation. I am going to switch the screen now to a short evaluation and ask that you all take a few moments to fill this out for us. Uh, we'd like to thank SAMHSA again for allowing us to share this information with you today, and thank you all again for joining, uh, joining us. Please take a few moments to fill this evaluation out for us and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you.